Welcome B2B Tech Hug user group people. We are here today talking with Jackie from Quest Digital about how B2B tech marketers can build trust through their content marketing. Everybody blogs a lot, but is that really building you the trust that your tech company's brand needs? We're gonna go through introductions here quickly, uh, then get to the meat of the presentation. We will have time at the end for Q&A. Jackie has asked that all the questions be held to the end. That said, there is a chat pane. If you go to the right-hand side there next to attendees, you'll see chat. Um, go ahead and drop your questions in there at any time. I'll be kind of fielding those in the background so you don't forget. Um, but instead of interrupting Jackie, we'll save those till the very end of the presentation as well. All right, a little bit about me before we get started. My name is Jen. I'm the owner of a digital marketing agency and HubSpot Platinum Solutions provider called Kiwi Creative. We work just with growing B2B software and tech companies, which is obviously the reason that we're leading this hug here. We're very passionate about um, getting that B2B specific advice out to all of you smart tech marketers. We host these events once a quarter. Uh, the next one will be in June about website design and usability. Um, I have a CTA, as any good marketer does, at the very end of this presentation. So if you're interested in that topic, we'd love to see you back at future events as well. All right, I'm going to go ahead and put myself on mute and stop the video just so I don't uh, get any buffering issues here. But Jackie, go ahead and take, a, take it away. Sure, no problem. Just a little bit of information about me, but really glad to be here. Jen and I have known each other for a number of years. It's kind of surprising how many years, but uh, just again, so you know a little bit about me, I head up Quest Digital, which is an internal and external agency, part of a regional publishing group right here in Cleveland. Pretty much been in media most of my career, um, working on content, uh, digital content syndication, and and really one of the the proudest moments of everything that I've done was uh, create a podcast that was created for women and by women. Um, but again, being a little bit ahead of my of my time, the podcast came out before there was the iPhone. So there was that going on for me. But um, I'm excited to be here, excited to talk with you and, and look forward to your questions as well. So let's start with a quick assignment. Can I take out a blank sheet of paper if you have one next to you? And on that paper, write the name of someone you trust. Or you can write the name of someone that trusts you. Fold it up and we're gonna revisit that later. How many of you know who this is? I can't see you, but I'm gonna take a guess that over half of the people watching this knows that this is actress Reese Witherspoon. And not only is she known for her acting and producing abilities, but she's also an entrepreneur with the launch of her clothing line named Draper James. Now in the beginning of the pandemic, Draper James posted to its more than 760,000 followers on Instagram that it was gonna offer teachers a free dress for their hard work during the pandemic. They were instructed to apply by a form, given a deadline, and then told the winners would be notified, as well as the offer was valid only while supplies last. Reese herself went on the Today Show offering to thank America's homebound teachers with the free Draper James dress. And many of Reese's fans really applauded this effort to support teachers during the COVID-19 challenges. The related posts on Twitter and Instagram were just a great example of how brand leaders can lend support to customers and really deepen the trust they place in our businesses. Until it wasn't. You see, teachers who had applied for the free dress started to complain that Draper James was spamming them with marketing messages. Some began wondering if anyone had received the dresses that were promised. And then, you know, after applicants went back to read the fine print in the offer, they took to Twitter to express their anger and frustration upon discovering that Draper James only planned to give away about 250 dresses. Now, considering nearly a million teachers applied, that lack of clarity around the meaning of while supplies last really wasn't appreciated. The problem was is that Draper James is a company that's only five years old and it has fewer than 30 employees. It only had 250 dresses in six different styles to give away. 
Now, considering there are more than 3 million public school teachers in the United States and a large majority of them are women, numbers weren't just going to add up. The application form crashed almost immediately, and just days after the original post appeared, it had been viewed by more than 400,000 people. Teachers were emailing one another and sharing it online. And by the close of the application, Draper James had almost 1 million applications. Again, the numbers just weren't going to add up. Very quickly, the desire to help started to look like a cynical marketing ploy, and a new term called celebrity COVID washing was born. That wasn't the worst of it. That backlash continued, and it became clear that not only did the teacher community feel offended by the marketing and promotion, the coupon consolation prize started to make teachers feel that Draper James really was out of touch with them and clearly was not understanding of their financial situation. Sometimes as marketers and leaders in our organizations, we understand that Draper James dress debacle is something that can easily happen and probably wasn't likely meant to cause harm to the teacher community or the company. But unfortunately, that company has lost something really valuable that not even the goodwill of its celebrity founder will be able to overcome easily. Good intentions or not, they seeded mistrust in the minds of their customers and audience. Unfortunately, Reese and her team has stayed silent about the mistakes made, and with that silence really jeopardizes the brand trust they've worked so hard to build. And earning that trust back with teachers and her customer base will not be easy road. So let's dig into why brand trust is the most important asset you can build. And don't worry, I'm going to even have a few tips for Reese and Draper James later. Now, I spent my career, as I mentioned, working for media organizations and in newsrooms. Public trust has and continues to be the cornerstone of a free press. I grew up in an era where being a journalist was one of the most respected occup occupations. Can you guess who this is? Well, in case you're too young or really, I'm too old. Meet Walter Conkright. He's an American broadcast journalist who served as an anchorman for CBS Evening News for 19 years. During the 60s and 70s, he was often cited as the most trusted man in America. Then, just as today, trust is the foundation of an audience relationship. As digital platforms became the way most people got their news, I saw a very concerning trend emerge. Consumer trust in news found on social platforms and search engines continued to fall. That's according to the Trust Barometer study by Edelman. And while consumer trust toward traditional and online only media publishers is growing, as organizations and brands, we distribute the majority of our messaging through these online platforms. So we have to start asking ourselves, are we risking the trust we have built or the future trust we need to build? Now, if you're thinking, why does this matter to me? I'm not the news. Well, if you create content for an audience, welcome to my side of the street. You know that your audience, your communities, your customers are depending on you. And brands aren't immune to the decline in trust. In fact, in the 2020 report, only one in three can trust most of the brands they buy or use. And a recent report by the Havas Media Group surveyed 395,000 people and determined we've entered the age of cynicism and brand trust is at an all time low. In fact, 71% aren't convinced brands will deliver on their promises, and only 34% say uh, they're transparent about their commitments and promises. And really, 75% of brands could disappear overnight, and most people wouldn't care. Ultimately, trust unlocks deeper, more resilient relationships between the brand and its consumers. Trust is now the make or break difference maker for brands. Those who highly trust the brands they purchase for will reward them. Consider a couple stats. 75% of people with high brand trust say they will buy the brand's product even if it's not the cheapest. 60% of people with high brand trust say they're comfortable sharing personal information with the brand and they pay attention to the brand's communications. 78% with high brand trust say they're likely to share or repost content about the brand and they also recommend the brand to others. And, and most importantly, they'll defend the brand against criticism. 
We can all agree that trust is good, but it's not quick or easy to build or to restore it if it's lost. All right, it's time to hear from you. Talked about those chat questions. From research, we know that people grant their trust based on two distinct attributes. In the chat, and you can just do this by numbers, you don't have to write the words, which two attributes do you think it is? Competence, ethical behavior, familiarity, or perceived value? I'll give you a second there. All right. The answer is number one, competence, and number two, ethical behavior, doing the right thing and working to improve society. So how'd you do? Well, nowhere is this more evident than in the annual Gallup Trusted Profession Studies. The poll found that medical professionals, professionals overall were highly thought of, with at least 60% of Americans saying doctors, pharmacists, and dentists, dentists had high honesty and ethical standards. Nurses, they topped the list. What's at the bottom of the chart? Sales, advertising, with a few of the politicians mixed in the cesspool of mistrust. <laughs> well, here's a rub for marketers. How can we build trust if by the very nature of our job is to market or to sell our product and services? Let's face it, self-gain is part of the equation. So let's look at trust from the perspective of the B2B tech buyer. According to Trust Radius, B2B tech buyers consider user reviews, free trials, and demos as the most trustworthy and influential information sources when making a purchasing decision. And as you can see, the least influential and the least trustworthy are the vendor's product website and the vendor's representative. Now it's clear that we're not focused on the same factors. While buyers care most about the content and qualitative feedback, Vendors think the most important factor is the product's overall score or star rating. In reality, vendors underestimate the importance of review content by 61%. So if we don't agree what's important, then we risk increasing mistrust rather than building trust. So how can we get on the same page of our prospects and build trusted relationships? Well, uh, we're going to use the word trust and, and use it as a guide to remember the things that we can do to build and regain trust. T stands for transparency. Now, imagine if, for a moment that if brands really embrace transparency, for example, being transparent in their advertising slogan. Well, that's a question a graphic artist asked himself when he came up with a blog called Honest Slogans on Tumblr. We might see ads more like this one. And you know exactly when you get to that moment where you're looking at the extra parts and, and wondering if you forgot something. Or if you're a parent, there is no greater pain in the world than stepping on a Lego. Oh, and yeah, by the way, I know this smell. My office used to be directly above a subway. And at 10 a.m., we would start evacuating the office as fast as possible to get away from it. And not even the Girl Scouts are immune. The point is that transparency can be scary, but being open and honest is more important than ever. So why does transparency matter in B2B? Well, according to Todd Capone, author of the Transparency Sale Book, every interaction with a prospect, you're either building trust or you're eroding it. It never stays the same. So why do 96% of consumers look at reviews? They want to know what to expect before going into business with you. The last thing they want is an organization to overpromise and underdeliver. They want transparency. But if we're being transparent, this is the state of much of the B2B lead generation happening today. I mean, really, I personally know CEOs and CMOs who refuse to invest any time on LinkedIn because of the barrage of business development messages and in LinkedIn messages. So if we go back to that IKEA example, there are thousands of memes just like this one, and everyone, including IKEA, embraces it. They laugh about it, and you don't go to Ikea expecting something that it's not. But does that radical transparency keep Ikea from being the top furniture company in the world? No, 
Not at all. In fact, they're number one furniture retailer in the world for the last 10 years. So if we go back to that report by Trust Radius, B2B buyers say that vendors' website and other information they provide are the least trustworthy of all the resources. So how do they suggest improvement? More transparency. Being upfront about weaknesses. And second on the list is to help buyers with their purchase decision by providing ROI tools and other purchase justifications. A great example is inventory management software Fish, Fishbowl. Now, their website is just chock full of information, reviews, and a demo opportunity. But my favorite resource is their ROI tool. And it's not a sophisticated piece of software. It's just a simple eight-page PDF. Bright Edge offers a web-based ROI calculator that I love, and I've used it many times to explain the value of SEO with small businesses that might find some of the concepts of SEO daunting. Think about the ways you can help your customers solve a problem or answer a question by providing a simple calculation. All right, next up is R, relationships. Trust can be built by collaborating with people who have a relationship with your audience. Now, the role of influencer does not look the same for B2B as it does for B2C, but there's no doubt that creating partnerships can be very influential in a B2B sale. B2B influencers generally fall into one of these three buckets, thought leaders, both internal and external, brand partnerships that share a similar audience, and internal influencers. And when we explore the type of activities influencers participate in with brands, the vast majority collaborate and promote content with a significant lesser amount participating in events or an endorsement of the product. And that's according to top rank marketing B2B influencer report. In fact, a really great example is CMI. Now, I know we think of the Content Marketing Institute as a media company, but just as true is that Joe Polizzi built an amazing multi-million dollar company with the combination of content and influencers. By the way, the majority of that influence is and was free. So how do you get that type of influence for your product or service? Well, just like any content program or marketing operations, you gotta begin with your audience. Who are you seeking to influence and who do they listen to, watch, retweet, quote, and so on? There are paid options, but I love this tool so much that I think it's a good place to start, even if you do have the paid options. It was co-created by Rand Fishkin, who is the founder of Moz of SEO fame. He also saw a need in the market for brands to do audience research and to use that online data for that audience research. So let's dive into some recent research I did for a client who specifically wanted to find influencers in the content marketing software space. Quick search using that term content marketing software illustrates that we have over 518 people that discuss this topic significantly over time. They've built online authority about the topic. On the left, you'll see all the data sources we can scrape and dig into deeper from websites, and we can see main sources as well as hidden gem gems of this audience. And SparkToro even gives you ideas and examples on how to use this data. Now, the free version will not allow you to create a list or engage, but it gives you a working target list for your content creation and promotion. So have fun with SparkToro while they still have the free version available. I think you get like 10 searches per month. Oh, and this tool also helps you identify press outlets to connect with for pitches. One of my favorite features is how to apply this data, which directly links to a blog post that offers specific tips. And remember to keep the audience of, top of mind whenever you're considering creating content with an influencer. Three questions to ask yourself before engaging with an influencer for content co-creation. Will this content be useful for my audience for months or years to come? Are people searching for this content now or in the near future? And will this content resonate with folks who already subscribe to my content? There are no right or wrong answers here, but those answers will lead you to how much resources to invest in your content and really how to measure its ROI. 
All right, let's move on to you. And in my opinion, it's the most important strategy that every brand should be including in their marketing plan, encouraging, curating, and distributing user-generated content. Quickly to level set what UGC is, any content, blogs, tweets, posts, videos, images, reviews created by users on an online platform. As a social media marketing tactic, UGC is quality content that's curated or directly received from users and then shared on your social media pages. The fact is that UGC is 35% more memorable and 50% more trusted. So why have these non-branded images built trust? Here's just a few reasons. They promote authenticity and a credibility boost. They present an undeniable social proof uh, because really we trust recommendations from real people. Gives the consumer a voice and shows that we care about that consumer voice. And it makes people feel like they're part of an online community. And finally, customer reviews expand your SEO efforts and help you rank higher. UGC, again, is a part of every marketing strategy I create, and it's really crucial to success. So let's take a look at some B2B examples. One company to follow on Instagram because of how they embraced UGC is Adobe. They started Art Maker series where designers were asked to share their creative artwork and highlight their skills using any of the Adobe products, such as Illustrator, Photoshop. Adobe then used these shared designs as UGC for user recommendations, product feature promotions, and other expert endorsements. With such UGC, Adobe has showcased its design capabilities, and they launch new user challenges via hashtags on a regular basis, so they're an inspiring brand to watch. Longer formatted customer views are usually a great inspiration for potential customers to identify themselves on how or why they use a certain product. Embed reviews is a great example of how case studies can work as UGC in the software industry. You can use a widget like Embed Social or just find opportunities to weave in collected quotes or reviews. Company culture posts are another form of UGC that drives high engagement rates and differentiates your company from its competitors. Consider sharing content created by your employees, like an inside look at the day of a life of your marketing manager or employee-generated blog posts. Several studies has re revealed that this employee engagement also has a positive impact on brand sentiment. So check out the hashtag meet MailChimp for ideas on this tactic. Let's go over to S. S is for serving more and selling less. Let's use this simple activity to get more service minded. And I've used this quite a bit for the brands that we work with. Draw a Venn diagram and in one circle list the problems that your audience and industry are grappling with. In the other circle, list all the areas that your brand's expert, of your brand's expertise and attributes. Now, in the space where the two circles interlock, identify two to three themes where your audience and brand interests intersect. Now, this may take you some time and may not even happen overnight, but this really should be the start of every content marketing initiative. Check out how one of my favorite science museums in the world, the Explorium in California, how, what they did with their content during the pandemic. Now, even though they were closed, they strategically used their digital footprint to support their audience. This included making strategic changes to their Google My Business landscape and their Google paid ads. Now, if we apply that Venn diagram, we can easily see the sweet spot between the audience of parents and educators that are dealing with children at home. The parents wanted to find more than just fun activities, but entertainment that had educational value. The educators needed to find instructional activities that their students can do at home and not in the classroom. Well, the Exploratorium excels at edutainment of science concepts, and they can provide and did provide this fun, accessible content on their website. The result was a comprehensive content platform geared towards parents and a distinct but just as robust second platform focused on educators. And I also loved how they weaved the donation opportunity through their entire customer path, from search to social and on their own properties, 
they remind the potential donor how important they are to their reopening. So once you've completed your Venn diagram, you'll want to dig deeper and want to know what is your audience asking and how can you provide content that answers those questions? Well, Answer the Public is a tool used by both B2C and B2B organizations here in the US and UK. You simply choose a topic, brand or product and search. Now, I tested it with, again, content marketing and voila. The results is a data visualization of popular questions of online queries about that topic. Now, this simple tool will give you plenty of topics and ideas to plan your content for an entire year. Now, again, I use content marketing, which generated about 343 results. And I know this visual, visualization is a little tough to read, so let's look at the results in a different way. We explore the top questions. You can see how this, you can use this tool for inspiration. For example, we know that how questions work really well for YouTube and search. If we just create YouTube videos based on these questions, we're tapping into a very powerful search listening opportunity to find and grow your audience. And finally, commitment and consistency over time matters most when you're building trust. You probably heard this quote by Warren Buffett in the past. What often gets left out is the last four words. You'll do things differently. And I often wondered what he meant by those words. Well, what Warren Buffett meant is that the core of maintaining a great reputation is never risking your integrity. These statements from Buffett are all about making sure that you stay true to yourself, your values, even when faced with challenging and stressful situations because trust over time builds reputation. Now this is impacts research um, that shows that reputation plays a big role in driving success for cultural organizations. And I love that they created this data visualization of reputation because what it shows is that what others say about you is about 13 times more important in driving your reputation than all the things that you pay to say about yourself. One uh, organization that really leverages its content off their website and on social platforms is the Monterey Bay Aquarium. Now they recognized that soothing content was something they could contribute to during the pandemic and they doubled down. From live feeds on their YouTube like this jelly cam to guided meditation on Instagram, even though they were closed for months, they understood that they had an obligation to serve their audience during this time when they were stressed out. And by the way, their donations increased year over year, even though they were closed. While B2B marketing and sales processes differ from a B2C approach, there has been an evolution of expectations for service. Today's B2B customer is tech savvy, digital native, who seeks a B2C-like experience in his day-to-day -day operations. GE is one of the most admired companies in the world in both the B2B and B2C worlds, but they have been losing brand trust over the years. One awesome and recent move was the launching of the sci-fi podcast series called The Message. Now, it follows a fictional scientist working to decode an extraterrestrial message using technology developed by GE. It's an eight-part podcast that has generated more than 5 million downloads and reached number one on the iTunes podcast chart. They followed it up with a sequel called Life After, and this bold marketing strategy paid off as it really changed people's perception of the brand and provided an entertainment value that will be remembered for a long time. Check it out. You're going to love it. Trust in tech is a complicated issue, and I really encourage you to dig into the Morning Consult's Most Trusted Brands report. It's chock full of data points, but I wonder if you can guess what the report said is the number one trust builder for tech companies. Again, let's just do a little chat. Which one do you think? Is it, well, I got a drink of water, perceived political affiliation, data privacy, or not allowing misinformation on platforms. Well, if you chose data privacy, you are right. 
According to the report, consumers consistently cited data privacy as their number one driver of purchasing intent and trust builder. So remember that when you're collecting data and how you collect that data and how you use it. Oh, and we can't leave Reese hanging. So what about Reese and Draper James? How do they start to earn back the trust of teachers and other customers offended by their COVID washing promotion? Well, if we think about the basic principles of building trust, we can apply them for regaining trust as well. This is Dorothea Draper, Reese's grandmother from whom the clothing brand is named after. And many of these simple principles are really what our grandmothers have been telling us for years. They're called the golden rules for a reason. So let's quickly review what Reese can do. T, be transparent, apologize publicly, personally, and on the same channel used to promote the initial offer, not just an impersonal PR statement. Respect the relationships developed with their audience. A mistake was made and as the high profile face of Draper James brand, it's up to Reese to own up to it by speaking directly to those impacted. Engage her fans to help her understand what pain they went through and communicate this apology. Focus on the user. You know, many people felt that signed up for the promotion really felt tricked and duped by a marketing ploy to gain their email address. First thing they should do is remove all the 1 million teachers in their database and tell them that they're doing that because they feel lured into filling out a giveaway form. Show what you're doing to earn back your audience's trust by serving your audience day in and day out with authentic behavior. And finally, you may have heard uh, the saying that time heals all wounds. Well, in the case of trust, time is definitely required. Draper James needs to really replace that gap with many more good experiences for their audience, selfless donations, community-focused advocacy, and multiple doses of humility will help them regain goodwill. It's unlikely that they'll win back all the million email addresses, but over time, they will gain back more real relationships. The question is, what are you doing to actively build trust with your customers? In a world where your brand is less about what you say and more about the collective experiences of everyone using it, you just can't simply rely on old marketing to meet the challenges of your future. For me, this is the foundation of modern marketing and really what content marketing is built upon is how can we strive to be of value if we do, trust will be earned and success will follow. Okay, so remember that sheet of paper? Who did you write down? Now, second favor, replace that name with your customer, whether it's a real life customer or a made up name. And think about that person every time you post on social media or write copy for an ad or a brochure. How are you going to help them? What are you going to say to them? What can you do to support them? Would you talk to them like some slick way or would you talk to them about what their life is like and how a, a product or service can help them? How can you be a brand, an organization that they can trust? And that is pretty much the end of it. I look forward to hearing your questions about everything that we reviewed. Again, you can reach me via LinkedIn. Um, or any of the other social media spots, and I'd love to connect with you. All righty. I did not see any questions pop up in the chat while you were talking, but if you do have them now, it'd be a great time to, to put them there. While you're hopefully typing, I'm going to do a little bit of self-promo here. That link that Jackie has on her last slide is actually a survey that our agency is asking uh, tech marketers right now to answer. It's all about your content marketing program. Um, that sounds scary, but it's super easy. It literally is a couple multiple choice questions. Uh, should take you no more than five minutes to complete and we give away a $5 digital gift card at the end too. So if you'd like to contribute to our resource and answer that survey there, um, again, everything will be hyperlinked in the PDF that gets emailed out after the event. Jackie, do you still have my last slide 
on yep. there. Yep. All right. Uh, we'll go one more after that. As I mentioned at the beginning, we do these hug groups once a quarter. So the next one will be June 14th. Um, we'll be talking about website design and usability, kind of a good, better, best approach to how to incorporate usability into your, your website and your, your business processes in June. All right, I'm not seeing any questions in the chat pane which I guess just means, Jack, you did such a fabulous job with all of your examples. Oh, 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 Caroline is here. All right, she is saying, is there a good guide for LinkedIn protocol? She's new to an industrial company and doesn't want to overstep on the platform for the reasons that you stated. Uh, she's not an expert yet, so she's nervous about starting the comments. Yeah, so I, I'm sorry about starting comments. Is that comments? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, so... You know, the biggest issue with LinkedIn and anybody probably has experienced this before is the LinkedIn messages for connection and then immediately um, the opportunity to connect somehow in a demo or, um, you know, want some type of um, something from that person. And again, I think if you go back to how can we be a value and you keep that top of mind, that's the way media organizations really um, think about everything that they do, what value that they can bring to the audience, what insights they can bring to the audience. And you, if you follow that protocol on the content that you post, as well as um, how your, your uh, organization is engaging with people, then you're going to be all right. It's when we try and make a sale out of a comment or when we try and make a sale out of um, uh, a post on LinkedIn, it, it is just transparency. Everybody can see it. They know it. And you immediately start on that uh, erosion of trust rather than building trust. So she did include a little bit more detail after her original post. Oh. She said uh, she's a marketing coordinator and she's a little timid to start those conversations because she doesn't have the technical background herself yet. Um, I would counteract and say that a lot of tech companies are talking too technical and they really need to take it down a notch um, because yeah. there, there certainly are influencers in the buying process who want that technical information. Um, but a lot of people are looking for that easier for a, a beginning level marketing coordinator to understand info, like how does this solve problems? versus what are the exact tech specs of something. So exactly. don't be afraid about engaging just because you don't know the tech specs. You can always refer back and ask somebody else on staff if you need some, some backup help there. Yeah, I think you hit the nail on the head is that once you're in that level, you kind of, if you look at the customer path, they're really at that point not looking for technical information. And if they ask a question that you can't answer, it's okay to say, you know what, I, I, I can't I'll find that information for you. Happy to find that information. I don't have it in front of me, or I want to make sure that I can uh, connect with you offline to get that um, exact information. So there's always a way to um, make sure that if that's a customer that's interested in being that a little bit farther down in your funnel that way, to connect them with an expert. Yeah, I think in 2022, most people know that the person monitoring the social media accounts is not the technical engineer who's building the product. So it's, it's acceptable to, to go back and ask for more information. Exactly. Okay. All right. Any other questions here for Jackie before we end the recording? I'm awkwardly staring at the chat yes. and see nothing coming in. <laughs> No worries. We'll slowly start our goodbyes in case there's one last minute question. No, um, there are a lot of resources there. Again, I'm I'm very happy that you're going to be sharing the deck because um, there's a lot to dig into um, and a lot of opportunities to really build your your audience um, and content platforms so that you're serving and answering the questions that they're asking. Perfect. 
All right, Jackie, I'm officially going to call it. Thank you so much for your presentation. I know I learned a lot. Always love me a good Reese Witherspoon example here. Um, for everybody who's on the call, I'll go ahead and end the recording, and you'll get a follow-up message from me today with all the assets that we talked about. All right, thank you.